we should probably introduce ourselves. Hi, we're Becky and John. We're the co-founders of We Are For Good. We Are For Good is a new media company that's trying to democratize generosity, ideas, what's working, and how do we take care of each other in a way that honors our dignity, our mental health, our equity, and our inclusion. And so we're bringing you the best of ideas. We're here to love on you, and we have brought some powerhouses today to the stage. So we want to introduce you to the powerhouses, but love seeing you. Hey, Tamara from Colorado. Love and seeing Wyoming. Oh, my goodness. Bring it on. Hi, Cindy. So, Mm -hmm. okay, let me jump in here. So excited to introduce you to Travis Ning. He is the program director at the Ward Family Foundation. But I'll tell you, we met Travis. It's been a couple of years now when he was serving as executive director of the social impact organization, Maya. And he taught us so much about ethical storytelling and how to center dignity in your work. And he is one of the most brilliant thought leaders. And he's hard to find online because (laughs) he is just so humble and so kind. But his work has spanned more than 20 years. He worked in international development around the world. He knows that human connection is essential to finding solutions, but not the design of these experiences that can produce a negative hero victim narrative. And he's really walked us through that. We'll drop the link to that episode. If that's something that you are looking through and trying to wrestle through in the, in the chat today, we'll drop that. But really he has set his world up around dismantling the power dynamics that pervade international philanthropy. And so really excited to have him in the conversation. He's based in Guatemala and he completed the Mira Fellowship. And if you haven't heard of the Mira Fellowship, just giving them a shout out to incredible organization that's pouring in to young founders and um, new organizations that are really doing incredible world changing work. And that episode is going to drop on the podcast in a couple of weeks. So if you want to learn more about Mira, stay tuned. But I really am excited to introduce one of my new favorite friends from Oregon, Ashley Klinkscale. She is a senior advisor at Raise for Good. We got to give a little shout out to our friends, Maria and Becca over at Raise for Good. We love them so much. And she's got over 18 years of experience, like leading communication strategy for brands, nonprofits and orgs that's driving the strategy of their diverse, the team's diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. And so she had, you know, a little role where she was the executive uh, vice president, chief communications and impact officer for the Portland Trailblazers. That is a NBA basketball team, John Gray. But I got to give a shout out. She was also at the Oklahoma City Thunder right by us. And so really value the way she's pouring into this work at a professional sports level. But at Raise for Good, she is really shaping a new ecosystem where funders, nonprofits and companies are collaborating to drive equity change, which I am here for all of that. And I said it again, but she's from Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Ashley. And hugely honored to introduce Prisca Bay to everybody. She is calling in from New York City today. She is the vice president and head of partnerships for the the Haitian American Foundation. You may know him as TAF. But Prisca has this really incredible pedigree. I mean, she was just casually over at PepsiCo overseeing their gender diversity and women's strategy for the global diversity and engagement center of excellence. She helped develop and launch a hundred million dollar commitment to women and girls who work with leaders company wide on gender, gender parity and pay equity issues. But I'll tell you what, we have to drop Prisca's episode because she came into our house and talked to us a lot about the founding story at TAF and just the work that they're doing. The way that she sees partnerships is unlike anybody that I've met. It is so so evolved. She has such an evolved mind. And the fact that she's powering this into our sector right now, like incredible brain trust, Prisca, delighted to have you today on this episode. On this episode, I'm on podcasting. Yeah, we are. So, you know, it's really important to us to have a conversation specifically about DE&I because we look out across the sector and we see a lot of good work happening, but people are pinging us of like, hey, we want to go further. It's, we're way beyond saying, check the box. You know, that is, I hope you're not at an organization that this is that kind of a conversation, but what does it really look like to go deeper in that work? How do we make a incredible strong business case alongside of that too? And we're going to talk about partnerships. We're going to talk about values. We're going to go deep in this conversation today. And so where do you want to start? I think I want to start with Ashley. Like, and I think you've got the question, so you're going to have to take it on the chin, but really we, Ashley, you've got such a wealth of information and we want you to talk about how do we look at DEI as a business case statement. Like we need to know like how we got so many people that are saying, um, you know, I don't see the value in this, which if you don't see the value in including other people, which is our uh, number one value of our company, talk about the business case for this and how you've seen it play out in your uh, world. 
Sorry, was talking on mute. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to oh, be here. Um, and glad to have here. you, my friend. In a nutshell, in general, if you look at our country, the demographics are scheduled or predicted to change over the next 10, 15 years. And we're starting to see this in the most recent census. You're going to have to start meeting communities and their needs where they are across the board. And I think that's the biggest piece, whether it's our LGBTQ plus community or others. Um, since 1990, we've had Americans with Disabilities Act law, but have organizations, have venues, have facilities and beyond met those standards. And so to an extent, they have, but I feel there's an opportunity to go above and beyond. So as we look at business cases, absolutely. Um, and, but people are calling for more. And I think right now, the society that we're in, you know, to get people into our spaces and utilizing our products um, and, and engaging with our correct, the accurate community partners, it's important to understand those demographic, demographics bases and actually like model and market to them in a way in which the community feels valued but also trust the brand that you're presenting. Trust is a huge part, you know, being present and being intentional. So the business cake is, is like, you know, what can we do as an organization to make sure that we see long-term return on investment and engagement in diverse communities? What does it look like long-term, not just in the moment? So for me, that's really the business case um, um, angle for me from DNI. Thank you so much. I mean, this is more than just a kindness. This is more than what we should just do because it's moral. It makes business sense. And we got to think like a business nonprofits if we're going to continue to scale and sustain. So thank you so much for that, Ashley. I mean, that's a perfect segue because Travis, I've heard you say the best way you've seen an organization expand is to be generous. So you're speaking words that we love, but he said, the way we scale is to give it away. Would you talk about how that how you've seen that fuel your mission. Awesome to be here. So excited, nervous. Thank you. It's good to see you, friend. Excited. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot more conversation around this abundance mindset. I heard it referred to in a couple of sessions yesterday, and I think we're all suddenly gleeful to have it. I, I, I find it so refreshing. I'm guilty of having played the scarcity mindset game for the early part of my own career, mm -hmm. and like, it was a race to be first in line and push everyone out, out of the way as much as you possibly could. Working internationally, I feel I feel like I can't really compare it to the to the US scene. Um, but working in much and very profoundly scarcity, like there is scarcity where where I work a lot of the time. Um, and I think it just pervades and it pervades more and more into the sector. What we realized and and working in Guatemala was that this like everyone's job is really, really hard. And innovation requires collaboration. I heard someone say that yesterday in the session and, and you really can't innovate in the silo. And I think when we were just confronting problems um, and the challenges around, in this case, opening a secondary school for indigenous Mayan girls, we had no idea what we we're doing. And, and the requirement to really reach out and to find partnership, um, it wasn't really a, a, a could have, nice to have, it was really a must have. And I think that really opened up and zoomed the whole landscape out. I think what, and I only recently jumped the fence. So I'm having a hard time with this conversation because I'm still, you know, when you change jobs and you keep referring back to your old job, is it a your present job? I'm definitely doing that a lot and I keep doing it. And so I keep, I keep pivoting, but now I'm on the funder side. And I think um, I, I'm much more acutely aware having brought the fundraiser side with me, that this type of collaboration requires time and money. And so expecting organizations to partner and to knowledge transfer we might have the will, but we don't have the way uh, a lot of the time. And I think funders in particular need to think about that as we look at the ecosystemic approach to collaboration, I think you have to keep in mind that people are really, really busy <laughs> and they don't have the bandwidth to do this. They might have all the aspirations of the world. And I think from the funder side, I'm really looking to advocating for that too, that time and money are what funders have. And that's what the typically the organizations lack. And so what's the formula that we can look at to really proliferate this whole idea of collaboration more effectively in the sector. Oh, so beautifully said. I mean, Travis always has all the words and always, I love it when friend. he takes us to church with them. So <laughs> thank you for that incredible uh, just analysis there, because something that we've heard that's been a big trend in our community is people who are saying, look, I'm just one of the worker bees. I believe in DEI work, but I can't get my leaders on board. I can't get them to see that we have had a board, you know, of 25 white men who have sat on this board for 20 to 30 
30 years. I can't get my executive director to change our hiring practices. So Priska, I'm going to ask you this question and then I got to come back and introduce our incredible hey, Kevin, Kevin Clayton. But I, w- I do want to talk about accountability, Priska, because I feel like you are such an expert in this space. How do we foster that accountability at all levels of the organization, including the leadership, including our staff, even possibly our volunteers. Like, how do we hold them accountable for meeting our goals, those DEI goals, and making sure that all of those DEI efforts are like actually integrated into the culture and not making this a sort of check the box sort of initiative? Sure. And um, it's so lovely to be with everyone. Um, You know, I think when you think about diversity, especially in corporations, people need to understand that there are several layers, right, happening. There are, on the employee side, there are some things called employee resource groups. So these are like employees, right, who work at the company who really care about diversity, and they're trying their best. And then there's a chief diversity officer and those teams, and those are the people who are tasked day to day to do this work, and they're trying their best. And then there's a CEO, right, who, if they are the right kind of CEO, who is visionary and and right-minded and thinking about the business, they care about diversity as well. But oftentimes there's this layer between the CEO and the chief diversity officer, maybe one or two sometimes, where sometimes all they're thinking about is their day jobs and their day job is not diversity. So I really do think at companies, it's about get it's like bridging that link. And what does it mean? Does it make, make like, you know, do you have the chief diversity officer reporting directly into the CEO? Whatever that is, there has to be a better connection between the CEO and everyone who actually cares about diversity within the organization in order to move the work forward. So when it comes to accountability, you have to get everyone in line inside an organization for the work to actually happen and then to hold them accountable. And accountability means numbers, data, tracking, right? And there are some people who think like, you know, tie people's, you know, compensation to results, but that's really hard. I think that right now, and I'm curious what the other panelists think, Diversity is at um, an inflection point. People say they care, but you know, are they putting resources and power behind these efforts? I think that is a, that is a bigger question. Like, are people actually caring? You know, we have chief diversity officers, we have people doing the work, but are they empowered? Do they have the money? Do they have the decision making power? I think that is a thing that I'm really curious about, especially now. It's a few years after George Floyd. It's a few years after the Atlanta shootings, and I think right now is when we actually have to go back to those companies and those leaders and say, are you still doing the things that you said you were going to do two or three years ago? And I want to, I want to like pitch that and lob that to the panelists. If anyone wants to respond to that, I would love to hear your thoughts. All right. Great. Maybe, oh, hi, Kevin. Get in here. Well, Jill, how, how are you? It's so good to see you, my friend. What are you thinking? Likewise. Well, well no, I was just going to kind of chime in on the, kind of the question that uh, was asked. Um, Well, first, it's interesting that we're talking about kind of post-George Floyd, post-Atlanta shootings. This work has been going on for decades. DE&I is not new. What is new is the fact that it's at the forefront of everybody's consciousness like it is. So yes, do you have the resources? Those organizations that have shown progress in this have dedicated this as part of the operationalizing of DE&I into their business. When it's considered the DEI is kind of over here on the right and the rest of the business is on the left, that's why it's marginalized because it's not considered part of the business. Or if it's nonprofit, like we're having the conversation, is it really being leveraged to drive mission? So those, those are really the, the, the challenges around this. Does the organization look at DEI as a business asset, like they look at marketing, like they look at business analytics, like they look at all the other functions? It's kind of an extra. That is such good insight. And Tamara, I love your comment in the chat about this isn't optional. It's the only way forward. And I have to just say, even, you know, hitting it on the nose as a white woman, I think everybody has to be accountable to this. And for me, in my in my lens, just as an example, we've got to be able to look around and notice who's not at the table. Who's not being represented? Do I need to give up my seat to let somebody step forward? And I think having that level of awareness is going to build what Prescott talked about. It's going to build that empathy. It's going to build that in that inclusion. And then it becomes cultural. And even modeling that leaders has got to start with you because staff need to feel empowered to be able to do that. And so before we go on, I got to back it up and introduce the Kevin Clayton. He is one of my favorite humans that we have met on the podcast 
He is a senior VP and head of social impact and equity for a little known sports team called the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, but the thing is that we love so much about Kevin is his approach to DEI is just grounded in this belief that everyone is a part of the DNI landscape. He's responsible for developing and leading diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic planning for a host of um, organizations and groups that are tied to the Cavs. And we just love that he was named the Good Human of the Year like for 2020. Literally named like literally human. named Good Human. Please <laughs> go back and world. check out that, go, that podcast episode. But he also oversees the Cavs Community Relations Team and the Cavaliers Community Foundation and based out of Ohio. And he is a proud grandpa and just an extraordinary human being. And so, Kevin, I kind of want to go back to you again and just talk about you said that social impact just doesn't have strings attached. And we love that so much because you believe that DE and I should not be transactional. Talk to us kind of about why you think everybody does have a role to play in this movement right now. Yeah. So, so sure. And thank you for that kind introduction. Um, when we talk about the work of DE and I, and, and you said it earlier, like why wouldn't you want everybody included? The challenge has been that, and I'll go back to again, post George Floyd, it has been them against us. And the them is typically white males. And then the us would be women, people of color, and all others, if you will, um, including those in the you know LGBTQ plus community, everyone else. But when you exclude white males from the conversation of DEI, you have actually created the chasm of why people can't come together. Yep. I personally have lived a little bit of life. I've never seen two white males that were the same. So that's just me because everybody brings something different to the table. So the exclusionary piece happens when if white males don't see how they benefit from the work of DEI, why would they then support if this is something that they don't see them benefiting? Why would they support others benefiting? And that's just kind of human nature. So any plan that I have developed, I have developed it so that everybody who looks at that plan sees how they benefit. I can give you a very specific example. At the Cavs, we have a foundational plan that includes our workforce, our workplace, community, our marketplace, as well as supplier diversity. Everybody can see how they benefit in that. And they can see how they benefit from the standpoint that from a marketplace standpoint and within our fans, if we have specific strategies and tactics that are going to sell more product, that are going to sell more Cavs gear. How does everyone not benefit if our objective is to sell more apparel? And when it, how we connect from a diversity standpoint, are we connecting with all communities when we're even designing the apparel? So that's just one example, but I can go over multiple examples of it has to be inclusive. It has to be operationalized. And Prescott, to your point, we have, and at any place that I've done this work, it does tie to compensation. Everybody in our organization has a compensation piece because it's not just around the representation of how many people of color we have in the organization. It's more holistic. I love that. And as like a leader here of We Are For Good, I mean, we were challenged too of like, how do we infuse de and I work into just all the ways that we show up online through our media ecosystem? And we struggled to say, do we create a pillar about it? But after so many conversations, we're like, no, a pillar is going to continue to create some of the silos of this. It's like, how do we infuse it into every part of our business? And so I'm excited and listening with all these leaning ears. And I want to kick this to Ashley to say, what kind of structures or systems can be built within orgs to improve diversity and perpetuate DE&I practices just on a real, you know, practical level? Yeah. And I think Kevin, you know, hit on the head. can you hear me? I feel like I'm echoing. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, the best place to start is people need a strategic plan that's related to DNI. Um, you ask the question, you know, people are, are, you know, they're woke, but you know, all of this language that's come, uh, you know, post George Floyd and, and to Kevin's point, organizations and brands have been doing the work um, intentionally. And if you don't have a strategy about how this weaves into your organization, into your nonprofit, then yes, you know, it will impact financially because you're just, you know, blindly doing it to do something without a strategy of how to engage with communities and really meeting the communities where they are. And so I'll even say with Raise We're Good, you know, initiatives are laid out through the next three to four to five years and woven into all different areas of the organization. As Kevin mentioned, you know, retail, um, a large part of it is thought leadership. You know, how we spend our money at the supplier diversity standpoint is really huge. How are you a pipeline? 
um, to communities. I mean, Oregon is not a diverse community, but how are you? How are we a pipeline to other markets and engaging with this, this different community? So. Um, Woving it into branding, your community engagement, marketing, and community and corporate partnerships. But also, how are you communicating to these communities and being the megaphone um, for these communities? So, Love all of these departments, uh, departments and entities within organizations have some type of equity and diversity strategy and goal. It it, it should be a non-negotiable in, in my eyes for organizations, and the, you know they should be transparent with it. Put it in the for forefront what are the data and analytics behind it how are you just not throwing numbers out um there so i would say start from there <clears throat> that other pieces will then come into play you know if you know that your organization that needs more diversity then the key piece of your strategy is really going to be refoc focusing on recruitment and um substantially retention of staff of color of women um and lgbtq plus and disabled folks so i think putting a strategy in place and you know engaging the right folks will be, you know, a good really place to start. I, I'm just like seeing your arms widen as you say that. I mean, it's just such a warm and inclusive way to walk through this earth to make sure that everyone is feeling seen and that they do matter. And I do think that this movement is going to require many hands and many voices. And to your point, we've got to share that megaphone. And I want to talk about how we get more people involved. And I got to go to the queen of partnerships for this one. So Preska, I mean, I just think Taft does an amazing job of finding partners that are wholly aligned with your values to build upon these incredible ideals that you have that are, you know, growing up within your organization. And I want to talk about how do you work together to advance those goals? And, and like, what have you seen play out over at TAF? So the Asian American <laughs> Foundation is a new organization. We're only two years old. And when we launched two years ago, you know, right after the Atlanta shootings, um, one of the focus areas was engaging corporate partners. We really wanted to work with corporate you know, CEOs and chief diversity officers to talk about Asian Americans and how we could be a part of the inclusion movement. Because in my experience working at places like PepsiCo, leading diversity work on behalf of women, I always felt like Asian Americans were not maybe part of the strategy in a way that we could have. So, you know, in these two years, it's been really incredible to see just in all of our conversations how amazingly open and encouraging everyone has been about, you know, including Asian Americans in that perspective. And we've had a lot of honest conversations where, you know, people have said to me, like, we actually don't know a lot about the Asian American community and what the needs are. So I do think like I enter into all of these conversations and work seeing sort of opportunity and, you know, wanting to be open. Everyone should be open minded. And if people don't know, it's OK. You know, we teach, we learn, yes. we share. And I think that is the approach that we have at TAF is you know, doesn't matter if you haven't done anything. We want to be a partner. We want to be a partner with you in order to grow this work, not only for Asian Americans, but for all communities of color, because we do believe it. Diversity is a term that is for everyone. Right. I think, Kevin, you were sort of alluding to this. It's it's for everyone. All the policies that we are pushing for will literally benefit everyone. It means that when you're at a, in a room or at a table, you feel like you have a say. I think that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And I think that at TAF, we're kind of doing it for Asian Americans a little bit right now, uh, because I think for Asian Americans, for many employees in different companies, they haven't really spoken up until more recently. And we're really excited that people are and that there's a lot of momentum. But we do believe that what we're trying to do, we just want to push the conversation forward for everyone, not just Asian Americans. That is so beautiful. And I just got to like double click and lift something on that because I think the way your your organization is fairly new and the way that you have built it with such intentionality is so holistic. It is so open arms. And we had Jonathan Greenblatt mm -hmm. on the podcast, the president of the Anti-Defamation League, and we found out he was one of the instigators to say, hey, yep. we need an Asian American foundation. We need the ADL needs to be pouring into Black Lives Matter. And I think when you see other organizations rise up and put their arms around each other, gosh, that feels better. What an organic partnership that's leading to more growth, more understanding, more empathy here for all of it. I mean, I will note one of the benefits that we did have. So Jonathan Greenblatt did help found our organization. He went to a table of Asian American leaders and said, hey, there's a rise in hate against Asian Americans. You might want to do something about it. So my founding board members include Joe Tsai, who owns the Brooklyn Nets, right? Jerry Yang, who is a co-founder of Yahoo. So I have the privilege of having these incredible wow. leaders and other CEOs 
pushing for us. And that's something that we need in this movement. We need mm-hmm. very senior leaders, you know, who have to be very vocal and they have been. Here for that. Well, I mean, continuing on with this, I mean, it's so good about just getting more people involved. Travis, I want to tap your experience because you've just been so brilliant at this of just how do you engage with communities you're serving and building relationships? And then on that, how do you plan for a diverse stakeholder group to ensure that your efforts are both inclusive and responsive to those needs? Ooh, heavy question. That is a heavy question. Um, <laughs> on, on, as far as the first part in, in engaging with communities, again, I can only really come at this from an international lens, being from Colorado, but having really orbited outside the U.S. ever since leaving school. Um, and if you can all reflect back and think of a time you left, hopefully you've had the opportunity to travel abroad and be in a culture and in, in a country that is super confusing to you. And we all kind of lose our minds and in a way that, is the best part, but it also makes us often ignore all of the parts of this conversation that we've been talking about up until now. Um, I think it gives us often an excuse to not even try in, in terms of working with DNI elements in any way. Um, I think we're worse at it <laughs> as, as humans. We're worse at it when we're traveling outside of our comfort zones. And without the language, history, context, experience to guide behavior, we can do a lot of harm with our good intentions. And I think a lot of my experience has been seeing that. Again, it's really painful to see how good intentions can really translate into negative impact. Um, and and I agree with, with Kevin's point that it's always been around the DNI element, but in the realm of international development, this conversation is just beginning. Um, yeah. I think there's a piece to this um, that I've experienced and I started as a Peace Corps volunteer and that's all about sort of white saviorism and, and the whole thing. And I think denying the golden parachute that's been on my back um, since I was born and and trying to pretend it's not there. So you can, yes, you can move to a village and learn the language and eat, eat the food and learn all the customs and it's still there. And I think where I've learned is to acknowledge that it's always there. And again, um, all the other panelists have really referred to this, this, this notion of really embracing the idea of being an ally in this space, not pretending that we're all the same. Um, I can live in Guatemala and be in solidarity with people, but I cannot be those people. And I think really using that as a, leveraging that as, as a conversation starter when you're creating engagement spaces, acknowledging like, hey man, I'm not from here. I do not know how this works. <laughs> Someone needs, needs to help me. And I think opening that space and creating expectations of, of a fail tolerant space when you have an indigenous farmer over here and a foundation over there and you bring everyone to the table, um, just acknowledging this is gonna be uncomfortable and weird and we're all gonna fall on our faces more than a dozen times, but that's how we're gonna progress pr- progress through this conversation, which is all really new and, and exciting. And I think in the absence of that, it's just everyone just kind of defaults into the, their usual modes. So I think what I've been trying to do is try to create those spaces and the permission to make mistakes in this space and, and just to begin to have this dialogue where we really, really need it. Thank you for saying that, Travis. I feel I feel like you really hit that nail on the head because there's so much uh, learning and unlearning to do in this. I know I'm on my own personal journey with this, and it and it feels a little uncomfortable when you're sitting in such incredible privilege to say, "Are these the right words? Do I need to go this way?" And I think this concept of calling people in gently and calling instead of calling out. And, and having this foundation of humility, I think, is really imperative. And I want to go back up to a question that we had from Tamara. And I want to pitch this to the panelists. I don't know if you saw this. She's curious about what you think about, and Julie, you might have to, or tr- Tyler's going to have to scan down a little bit because I can't quite see the question. But it's about, thank you. How do you feel about executive DE&I roles? Um, she talks about, you know, she has, you know, and she's in an organization, you know, where you have this leader, but there's no buy-in. So I would love to know someone from the panelists that they could take this and address this for Tamara. Yeah, I'll be happy to to go, Kevin. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And for me, I I have been in the DNI space for over 25 years. So, you know, with that, um, if the, and the question had to do with at that organization, that they, they did not have a DNI leader, they had a panel of employees. Um, that is, I mean, I hate to be kind of the naysayer or kind of put, put water on your parade. That is not a a, um, a recipe for success because when it's led by employees and you don't have senior leadership buy-in, then it's more of like an affinity group where this is just kind of extra credit where people are just doing this work. 
it is not going to be successful. Or let me say it differently. You're not going to reach the kind of success that ultimately is going to change culture, going to change systems, that's going to impact the bottom line. And that was in some of the panels references earlier that if an organization does not take it serious and invest the resources, then it's it's not going to sustain. So, yes, you need leadership on that. But even the leader has to be equipped and has to know what they're doing specifically and have the skill set to be able to lead this work. Ooh, such good context. Yeah. Anybody else want to jump in? I was just one... oh, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Ashley. Are you sure? I mean, Kevin, Kevin is spot on and you see it, you know, in the NBA and kudos to Kevin, who's been around for 25 plus years doing the work and doing it intentionally. But it's so critical that it starts at the top. It's not bringing in a DEI manager or an affinity group. You know, it's starting with someone that is aligned with the CEO and ownership and executive team and doing the work intentionally throughout the organization. And how does it fall into the ROI? Um, and it doesn't fall on the shoulders of one executive. And I'm that person. After George Floyd, they looked to every black executive in the organizations to answer questions. And that is not the work of, of these executives. Um, this is for everyone, as, as we've talked about. And so the intentionality and, and long term, you know, some of those plans and strategies that were put in place after summer of 2020 and the, kid, the murders in Atlanta have now gone away from budgets. And so as you talk about the intentionality in long term, it's committing and, and doing the work and holding everyone accountable and it not just falling on the diverse employees or just this um, DNI executive. Preska, what about Preska. you? I mean, I uh, that everything Ashley just said. It's exactly like the the CEO has to be a partner, right? And the C suite have to be partners to the chief diversity officer. They have to be partners. They have to look to that person as the expert and take their advice and guidance. It's the only way it works. I mean, okay, this conversation, it's it's so in alignment with our values of how we want to show up as an organization and what we've even seen just make community happen, you know, and we show up in this way. So I want to talk about building this space where everyone matters. And Kevin, the case study you have at the Cavs is just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about the inclusive community that you've built and how can we kind of take some of those principles to create more inclusive workplaces too. Um, and so take us take us into your cool story. And I got to give Kevin's boss a shout out. Kevin and I have actually had this conversation who had, I don't remember, Kevin, if it was the owner or your manager that stepped forward and said, we're going to make this, we're going to be the the best at this. We're going to be a culture that defines this. So kudos to your your leadership for that. Yeah. And, and actually, that's where it would start from our ownership team led by our chairman, Dan Gilbert. Um, and as Ashley knows, uh, with a NBA team, you don't do anything uh, that's forward facing that's going to have any kind of positive or negative impact on a team without the owner of the team giving a thumbs up. So the work in which you've seen that we've done has full support of our ownership or, or I should say our, our, uh, our chairman, Dan Gilbert, and then kind of uh, cascading down to our senior leadership team. And kind of what Prescott said before, our entire leadership team, starting with our CEO, um, who is Nick Barlage, who he and I have done podcasts together that talks and where he's talked about what it takes as a white male to lead this work. So, yeah, I have the title, but at the end of the day, he's leading the work because he's giving me the resources and the support and he's leading the tone from a culture standpoint. And that's internally and externally. So what we have tried to do, and it's been four years since uh, since I actually came on board to kind of create our, our, our DEI team that now has evolved into our social impact um, and equity team. We started really for four months identifying what do our team members feel? And we call our employees team members. What do they feel? What do they think? What do our fans, what do they feel? What do they think? What do our suppliers feel? What do they think? Everybody in our ecosystem. So our plan is built around everybody we interface with. Fans, suppliers, team members. So with that, we then built our strategy around that. And there were some commonalities that went across that. And what we identified, there were two or three key points, one of which is we weren't as inclusive as we perhaps we thought we were. So we identified what we could do to be more inclusive. Secondly, we hadn't really defined what equity meant. So we had to term, but nobody really knew what that meant. So we then defined it and then talked about behaviors that were driving uh, the kind of we, we, we identified the behaviors that we wanted 
and we have those behaviors as identifiable factors, identifiable factors for our organization. And then the last thing that we did, which I've mentioned before, but I just got to tell you in business, and it doesn't matter if it's nonprofit or, or for profit, when this work is not tied to that that motivates people to do their job, it's not going to get done. So it's been tied for the last two years to performance development and compensation because that's the language that we speak for everything else. We don't ask people just to go out and work just because it's the right thing to do. It's purposeful. It's tied back to our organizational objectives, our organization's mission, and the values of our organization. So that's how we have been able to do that in two minutes or, or, or less to connect the dots to that that drives the organization on an ongoing basis. What you've built, Kevin, is just so beautiful. And I, I just want to lift it as a pro tip for everybody, this notion of listening. And I think that has been so powerful for your community, Kevin. You don't just target one specific, maybe it's your season ticket holders or your sponsors, you listen to everyone. And this is not antithetical to us in nonprofit. This is how we build relationships with people who care about our missions. And so I thank you for that. I also just want to put another heart on Sonia's comment in the chat. I think it's absolutely spot on and just love it. And as, as we're starting to wind down a little bit, I have one more question. Um, for Ashley and I, and we just like to hit these things right between the eyes and address the elephant in the room. And we're just hearing, even in 2023, you just hear these complaints that DE and I efforts just lead like to the most qualified person being passed over, you know, for the sake of meeting a diversity quota. And I just feel like that is a myth. <laughs> and yet there's still so many C-suites that like fail to reflect on diversity of communities. And I want you to talk a little bit about how you've seen this and kind of dispel that myth for us. Absolutely. Um, super, Look at super her. She's like, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Put me in code. <laughs> super, super misguided. And we can use the C-suite representation as an example. It's I'm, I'm always shocked that people assume that folks are unqualified. Um, like That's the basic foundation. Disbelief that women, people of color, openly gay, LGBTQC staff, you know, members are there to fill a quota versus earn their spot. Um, you know, and we have to kind of peel back our own assumptions of where we are and, you know, who we are and what we believe and why. And it's uncomfortable conversations, but it's healthy. And that's get us that gets us to, you know, movement and traction to, to where we need to go and grow. And I often hear, oh, you know, we need to hire the right person and not just hire, you know, people based on color. And, you know, why do you assume the person of color was not the best person? You know, and, and how are you reaching out and recruiting it? And so it goes back to our the original notion of why do we believe a C-suite um, person looks like or what gender is the view of a white male? Um, I mean, you can go back to the 80s and I'm aging myself. You know, you think about the kind of power on Wall Street uh, in those that ideas and then women who were trying to break into the C-suite wearing big shoulder pads because that's that's the power look, right? Um, black women carry on the largest amount of master's degrees in this country. And so to say that these women are not qualified, it's just based off an assumption. Um, and, and that's not to say every black woman with a master's degree is qualified, but there's statistics to back up at least one, um, you know, on paper that the education the experience is there, um, you know, in this case. And so again, the myth, that that's there and, and how you engage, you know, I attended a historically black college and university, how are organizations engaging and meeting these HBCU graduates where they are um, and other diverse communities, you, you know, it's not LinkedIn. It's not just MD, you know, how are you um, engaging, you know, this first piece of breaking free from these myths, freeing yourself of the notion that just automatically hire any diversity hire. Hmm. I mean, I love this conversation because of just the diversity of the voices and experiences among this panel today. And, you know, from hanging around the podcast, we are going to ask you what your one good thing is. And before I go into that, I want to lift because I see you in the comments. I know hearing a big story like Kevin's, I can feel the same way, too. It's like the pro team probably has this massive budget or they have all these fans. But it also just points to what are the principles? What are the, you know, habits that are underneath the surface and what I heard is that you're listening. I mean, still to have a budget at all and still prioritize listening, I think says so much, Kevin, about how y'all approach the work. So as I ask for your one good thing, 
I'll just ask for, you know, what are something that is really applicable? What is something that you see as a principle that could really speak to people today that are listening? We have such a diverse array of people listening today. So Travis, we'll, we'll Travis. start with you. I feel like I'm honored to be alongside these other panelists. And what I heard them say really echoes with me. And it's, it's deeds, not words. I loved what Ashley said about put it in your plan. And, you know, Chris was talking about like leadership, really putting it in action as far as like a, a CEO director level and Kevin echoed that as well. I think it's, it's enough, enough time around talking and, and yes, putting it into action means risk and mistakes. Um, but that's how we grow. Mm, fantastic. Presco, what about you? Just really quickly, um, following up on what Ashley said, have an open mind. I've been in many meetings where we evaluate senior leaders to come into the company. And sometimes white guys just come in because they're the white guy who's going to get that job. But whenever it was a diverse candidate, they were always scrutinized in a way that the white guys weren't. So that is a reality that happens. So have an open mind that sometimes there are different standards. And with that diverse candidate then steps into that very big role, we have to set them up for success. And sometimes these companies just don't do that. So when you see someone fail, don't think like, oh, it's because they weren't qualified. Have an open mind. Maybe it's because they weren't set up for success, right? And so I think when it comes to diversity and seeing that and just just have an open mind and understand that, you know, sometimes we're not set up for success and that's the reason why it's not happening. Ooh. Okay, Ashley, what you got left? Priska nailed it. That was it. I mean, being set up for success and the intentionality in the work and being authentic in the work we do at any level. I've, to Kevin's point, I've been on the community side um, and, and having that same approach, I think, um, what's the long-term plan? It's just not out of the moments. It's just not external. Do the work internally within yourself, but also within your organization and team within those four walls. That's critical before you go put out a press release about a big donation that you've made. Um, you know, do, do the work inside your organization and um, build those relationships. Partner with your DNI. Be a thought leader. Be a thought leader and be partners and be open and have dialogue, have the uncomfortable conversations. That's how you, you move forward. I love that. We just talked about that in our last se session yeah. about having a bravery mindset and how that actually improves our empathy. It improves our world. It improves our health. So that's a great one. Kevin, round us out. Bring, Bring us home. home. Sure. So I have two thoughts. And the first is uh, and I've been going back in the chat. Uh, to the comment that was made earlier where someone was saying, oh, it's the Cavs, you all, this is a lot easier for you versus nonprofit. It's the exact same. It's it, the same principles, the same values are the same. And um, for the individual who was reaching out, I even put my email in there, please follow up with me and I can give you more directly just to help you. Um, but I would say two things. Keep this work simple. If you really think about what we're talking about is creating an environment where everybody can bring their best to the organization to be able to deliver the results that they were hired to deliver. Now, I know that's much simpler said than done, but that's really what we're talking about. How do we create an environment where I can be my best without having to carry all the weight of all that extra stuff that organizations put on my back, where I can just walk in the organization and that organization actually acknowledges that because I'm a black male, I have a unique life's experience that is going to help our organization. It's a different point of view with no judgment. There's just so much love on this panel. And I, I, I thank you for the way you all move through this world. I want to thank everybody who came into the chat. And, and I even say to Tamara, if you want to go further into Kevin's story or if anyone wants to, Julia, we're going to have you drop the podcast episode because we talk about how Kevin has put this work into small nonprofits. And I think there's also a great part in there, Kevin, about how you've really taken on the helm of being an ally to white men and to teach them how to really pour into this. And we need more allies in this. So if the, any part of this conversation um, has given you joy or made you uncomfortable, then I think we're doing the work right. Truly, I do. Yeah. Um, and I want to throw out one. I'm giving my one good thing. I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to. There's a fantastic book called Collecting Courage um, that 
is the story that's curated by a group of black fundraisers and sharing their experiences in nonprofit. And I will tell you, I know many of them and my eyes were opened when I read this book about things that I did not see and experience. And I think as we continue to expand our hearts, we've got to keep learning. We've got to keep listening to your point, Kevin, and hold each other accountable. So thank you to all of our incredible panelists. Thank you for the knowledge you've brought and the human beings that you continue to be in this world. And I would say these are all humans that are incredible <laughs> people to follow. Like as we talk about building your own personal board of directors, by following the people on this call, they're going to help expand your mind and kind of keep this top of mind. So incredible humans, go back and listen to these podcasts. So grateful that you joined us. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the next one. Rooting for all of you. Take Bye. care.